weird because I'm a student and you're the teacher. No. Like, when we last met, you were but a learner, now you are the master. I feel like the Sith. So we're in the Ape Theater, uh, which is a new comedy-based theater, which I have founded myself, Chris Cornelia, and uh, Alyssa Ford, who is a brilliant actress, and Brooke Topman, who is a sketch comedian. And we came together to really basically give ourselves a place to, you know, practice comedy like the way we like to. It's about your personal comedic voice coming out through this art or stand up or, you know, writing sketch or anything else, you know, like in the very beginning of improv class, I'm trying to get people to speak their opinions, to talk about things that they personally care about through the voice of their character. Because everybody as a little kid pretended one way or another, you know, like some sports kids pretended to be great sports people and indoor kids pretended to be cartoon turtles, etc. You know, when you ask a group of people like the same question, how did you, how did you pretend when you were a little kid? Well, it's something that we can all relate to. Like a shared ethic, it gets passed around and then they start to go, oh, that's good work, that's good work, I'll do good work. And being able to see 10 different people answer the same question in completely different ways and completely interesting ways, it points out how amazing and appropriate each point of view is, you know what I mean? You know? Because that's where truth comes, that's where funny comes from, that's where the surprises come from. So that, that's kind of what I'm going for. In opening a theater, I feel like I'm still studying with Ali in ways that I didn't even know. Like, I understand him in a new way now. Um, I, this is my little impression. Uh, yeah, you know, just making callbacks and connections. I, I look around, like, I've seen, lately I've seen some really amazing long form, but when I got here a year ago, I wasn't seeing that. And I, maybe I just wasn't going to the right places. It's cool, because this theater is literally underground. It is literally underground, and it is, I mean, a little run down. So it, it just gives me that feeling like stuff can happen here, you know? You can make mischief here, you can be naughty here, be a little dirty here. It definitely seems like it's growing, but there isn't that sort of concentration and density. Here, there's so much space. It's, it's kind of an easier way of life. Everybody in New York lives in these little tiny apartments, and it's good to get out of your apartment. It allows for the community to grow in some amoeba-like way, and that could be good or bad. You know? Because I don't have access to an Armando Diaz or Ali or TJ and Dave who would tour and you know come to New York and uh, you know what do you where do you go what do you do? Okay. And I just think you have to go deeper. You have to go deeper, and you have to be willing to experiment, and you have to become your own scientist of improv. Because the community is smaller. You have to set a standard for yourself, or that, at least that's what I have to do for myself. I have to set a standard and try to meet it, and hope that you know, hope that that can produce uh -huh. like work that goes beyond just showing up and you know, fart nuts and make them ups. Yeah. Things. But yeah, it's been you know that was in the fifties, right? Yeah. And then the sixties. Came after the 50s, yeah, and then I think the 70s were next. And the 80s happened. Yeah, that's, so that's, that's how the decades went in order. They, they went from the 60s to the 80s or the 70s in the middle. Yeah, exactly right. Fart nuts and make em ups. Yeah. So in the 70s, was it more punk rock or like I mean, people getting slaughtered? In the 70s, I was five. In 75, or I was eight. I was young in the 70s, so I can't answer questions about what happened in the 70s, but I'll tell you this, I paid my money, three dollars, to see Star Wars in 1977, and Han shot first. <laughs> How do I look, natural? Good, or beautiful. <laughs> So I start most mornings with some yogurt, um, maybe some blueberries, honey if I have it, although I'm not eating sugar right now. 
Um, yeah, and then I'll just kind of do that normal morning stuff, um, take a shower sometimes, get dressed. And then uh, most days I'll bike to work. Um, you know, it depends on the weather, but I do have some rain gear, so I'll try and be prepared with gloves and a mask and rain pants and um, I try and try and go almost every day. I live fairly close to downtown, so I'm, I'm close to where I work and that, that makes it convenient. And there's also a lot of other bikers on the road, especially um, on this same route that I take. And so it really feels like a normal thing to do and uh, I definitely feel safe. I usually feel really good after biking. I mean, there's maybe a month or two in the summer when it's really hot, and so then I get to work and I'm kind of sweaty or just a little bit tired from that, but most other months, um, I feel good when I bike in. Yes, so that was gifted to me by my mother, dearest. Um, I think it was a gift for my birthday. She's also a big believer in safety and um, she's a heavy walker, a serious neighborhood walker, uh, fast. And so she wears a light up vest that's like reflective and bright. Um, I think it's battery operated. She got me one of those as well. I'm a little embarrassed wearing that. So I prefer to just stick to this more tame jacket, but it is reflective and it's bright. And so I definitely wear it when it's darker. If it's winter is dark in the morning or just gets dark by 5 p.m. when I go home, um, I'll wear that. Some of the feelings I have are often just um, relaxation or kind of being at peace. Um, there are definitely moments of nostalgia because I ride a lot of the same routes um, every day. And sometimes it's for a year at a time. And so I, I'll think back to other times in my life and that were still that same that same route, so I'm still, it's like reliving that. Um, but it does feel freeing, like you said, and it feels um, really relaxing. Sometimes I kind of lose myself in it because I'm so used to it, and it has become so secondhand that I um, really will like drift off, <laughs> not to sleep, but to um, other thoughts, which is really kind of nice. I start to think about other things going on in my life as I'm writing. So uh, I make little printable heroes that uh, people can um, download and print at home and, and cut out and use for their tabletop games, and uh, yeah. Um, it can be really any game. I mean, let's think a board game that maybe is a little bit more involved where you actually have um, figures or rep representations of your characters or the monsters you're fighting, uh, or you know, you're fighting monsters, period. Uh, that's kind of a maybe a change from typical Monopoly board games you might be playing. Um, but some of the big ones people play are like Dungeons and Dragons is kind of um, what I personally play and use miniatures for. But uh, people do Warhammer, um, Necromunda, Mordheim, all kinds of different things. Um, and uh, yeah, and you can buy pewter miniatures, you can buy plastic miniatures, um, and then you can paint them yourselves, you can buy pre-painted stuff. Uh, or if you are on a tight budget, you can just buy paper miniatures and uh, print them out, cut them up, and yeah, hit the game boards to start playing. I love painting miniatures. I used to collect them. I just found myself not actually enjoying the games that I love because I just have time to prep and prepare for them. Um, just being an adult, having kids, having a day job, all that fun stuff. So. Um, I started uh, just making really simple paper figures that I could just use really quickly on the fly and, and then I started making them available for other people to use and it just kind of snowballed from there. But uh, yeah, it's kind of been an ongoing thing I, as I've kind of gotten into it and started to just learn more and uh, 
you know, just trying to keep myself from getting bored. Uh, it's just something that has kind of grown and gotten more and more complex as I go. Um, but part of it is I wanted to make a, uh, a real uh, valid alternative to uh, the metal and pewter miniatures that you get that are tend to be it's really expensive and they look amazing. Some of the stuff that like came to, uh, Games Workshop is uh, coming out with or there's a whole bunch of other different uh, companies. But um, so yeah, I was just trying to make something that really helped people's games when they're playing. They kind of want to have things that look good and kind of fit the stories, uh, especially for games like D&D or Pathfinder, any kind of role-playing tabletop game where you're, you're telling and kind of crafting this communal story. Uh, it really helps if the, the supporting art and accessories you're using really further that and kind of um, yeah, just help players' imagination, help them tell their stories. And that was really important for me kind of from the start was just try to do something that was accessible and uh, yeah, help people tell their stories. Uh, I was, I've been drawing forever and I was really uh, this this hobby kind of came to me because it was something that uh, I, I found myself working too much on day jobs and really wanted to get back into just like what is it that I really enjoy and the answer to that is like what did I enjoy when I was a 12 year old kid and uh, the biggest part of that was just making things for people uh, to then use and play and have, you know tell their stories. I mean, I really see this as kind of a golden age for this kind of thing, uh, as D&D is really getting big and it's kind of this renaissance of uh, games in general, board games, non-computer games. Um, and so we're seeing a lot of really incredible paper miniature artists coming out and doing some amazing work, and I'm kind of you know, riding that wave and being a part of it. Um, and I'd love to just keep doing it. Uh, ideally, eventually, full-time, I can just be waking up at 8 a.m., make a cup of coffee, and just go to work making these things. Yeah, that's always, I think, going to be riding a line with the uh, cost effectiveness of the technology, just like how, because the kind of the niche that I'm fitting in and I'm able to take advantage of as you know, just one person making these is that they're incredibly affordable for people. And once you start adding on technology, it starts becoming expensive. And so until that becomes cheaper and more accessible for people, I don't really see myself taking advantage of it too much. Although if ever, you know, 3D printers start really becoming affordable and everyone starts using them, then it would really make sense to you know, expand into doing 3D characters that you could print out instead of just paper ones. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, what is happening in the present currently is people have a lot of tabletop simulators where it's either on the computer or a tablet, mobile device, you can simulate a 2D tabletop and I, there are already people that are using my art and instead of printing it out with their home printer, they're plugging it into these virtual tabletops uh, and playing their games that way. Uh, in the future, really depending again on how technology goes and how affordable it goes, there's um, augmented reality is definitely a big thing. And I foresee in the future we're going to be people are going to be playing like Games Workshop games, you know, uh, with 3D goggles on, just looking at a bare table. And um, in kind of in that arena, I could see again if technology is cheap enough, there's a there's a space for just art being plugged in, kind of on a sprite based. There are way too many of them. Um, Vasculus, I think. I've been really excited about playing Vasculus. I've sketched that one forever. Uh, there's some other ones. Uh, Bullet, I think, would be a fantastic one. Um, it's this weird land shark like creature that bursts like from the ground and it has like a fin that you'll see in the earth and it bursts through and just mauls people. It's it's a D and D kind of traditional one that's kind of a classic and uh, I think you can do a really dynamic uh, pose. Yeah, uh, most challenging, man. Uh, so one of the things that happens a lot is I'll do the initial front view or something where I'm drawing these, and then I, you, know, you always have to do the back view because people are printing these out and the front and backs, and then I get myself in trouble that way all the time, where you, know, you come up with some brand idea and then you realize you gotta draw this, but I draw a lot of that. It's, it's, it's kind of weird, you know, like, you know, on a Saturday night, that's what I'm doing, and it's like, yeah, you know, I got a lot of butts to draw. Uh, you know, orc butts, goblin butts, you know, human butts occasionally, demon butts, lots of demon butts. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> 
How do I look? Natural? Good. Or beautiful. <laughs> Tell me about how many, about the morning routine getting to work. Absolutely, yeah. So I start most mornings with some yogurt, um, maybe some blueberries, honey if I have it, although I'm not eating sugar right now. Um, yeah, and then I'll just kind of do that normal morning stuff, um, take a shower sometimes, get dressed. And then uh, most days I'll bike to work. Um, you know, it depends on the weather, but I do have some rain gear, so I'll try and be prepared with gloves and a mask and rain pants and um, I try and try and go almost every day. And I, I live fairly close to downtown, so I'm, I'm close to where I work and that, that makes it convenient. And I feel good when I bike in. I still feel like I have a lot of energy and it's also just like a nice kind of refreshing thing to do in the morning. So it almost like wakes me up. And there's maybe a month or two in the summer when it's really hot. And so then I get to work and I'm kind of sweaty at that versus maybe taking the bus um, or the streetcar sometimes can be a little bit stressful um, so biking is like carefree you avoid all the traffic there are definitely moments of nostalgia because I ride a lot of the same routes um, every day I think sometimes I kind of lose myself in it because I'm so used to it and it has become so secondhand that I um, really will like drift off <laughs> not to sleep, but to um, other thoughts, which is really kind of nice. I start to think about other things going on in my life as I'm writing. My route specifically is safe. Um, the bridge that I take, the Broadway Bridge, has the barrier. It's completely separate from the cars. Um, sometimes I do hear about accidents and that can be a little bit scary. I know that there's also a lot of deaths for motor vehicle drivers as well, so um, I feel safe. I've been hit by a car. Uh, no, surprisingly not. I have had a couple of friends who um, were struck by a car, maybe not at a high speed, but uh, I've definitely had at least one who um, was hit by the person who opened their car door into the bike lane and they went tumbling over. Fortunately, it hasn't happened to me yet. So you're planning on it happening to you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I hope that it never happens to me. <laughs> Have you ever had any close calls? The answer would be yes. I've definitely had some close calls. There's been a few, a few accidents. I chose to ride in the ice. Um, the weather last winter was really bad and I I, there was black ice on the road that I didn't see coming, and so I took a spill and um, maybe bruised my knee, but I've never had anything really that serious. I wear my helmet. I wear protective gear. Tell us about your new jacket. How long have you had that? Yes, that was, yes, so that was gifted to me by my mother, Dearest. I think it was a gift for my birthday. She's also a big believer in safety. She's a heavy walker a serious neighborhood walker, uh, fast. And so she wears a light up vest that's like reflective and bright. Um, I think it's battery operated. She got me one of those as well. I'm a little embarrassed wearing that. So I prefer to just stick to this more tame jacket, but it is reflective and it's bright. And so I definitely wear it when it's darker. If it's winter is dark in the morning or just gets dark by 5 p.m. when I go home, um, I'll wear that. Pedal Palooza is probably one of my favorite events of the year. The most memorable and my favorite was the Prince versus Bowie ride because um, I loved them both, but you kind of had to choose a side and then the two different bike rides converged in southeast Portland and then they all rode together and there was a bunch of music and um, that was really fun. So that's an amazing event. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about your training and the bike race you did last summer and the purpose of it and how you felt afterwards? Yeah. Experience? Yeah, a little bit about the bike race. So I did the race called Re Reach the Beach. Um, I don't know 
yeah, I guess it was a race, but it felt more of just kind of a fun event. It was to benefit the American Lung Association. You got to decide where you wanted to start, whether it was in Portland or at some, um, some point on your way to the beach. And I wasn't ready to ride 100 miles from Portland, so a couple family members and I started in, um, I think it was in Newburgh. Um, it was maybe halfway there, so it was only a 55 mile ride from there to the beach, um, which was still more than I had ever ridden, but it was one of the best, best days of my life. It was incredibly fun. Um, when we got to the end, we just got some drinks at Pelican Brewery on the beach in Pacific City, and um, that was a nice reward at the end. So I start most mornings with some yogurt. Uh, most days I'll bike to work. Uh, you know, it depends on the weather, but I try and go almost every day. Biking is like carefree. You avoid all the traffic. So my route specifically is safe. Um, sometimes I do hear about accidents and that can be a little bit scary. I know that somebody, uh, a cyclist was killed on the Burnside Bridge um, and that that's definitely scary to hear about that but I know that there's also a lot of deaths for motor vehicle drivers as well so um, I feel safe. So that was gifted to me by my mother, Dearest. She's a heavy walker, a serious neighborhood walker, uh, fast. And so she wears a light up vest that's like reflective and bright. Um, I think it's battery operated. She got me one of those as well. I'm a little embarrassed wearing that. So I prefer to just stick to this more tame jacket, but it is reflective and it's bright. I did ride my bike to pick a thon. That was, um, that was a really fun event. I mean, they mentioned that you could ride your bike out there and it was like, it was definitely quite a distance. And so I wasn't, I wasn't sure. I mean, at that point, I think it was before any sort of training for any, like, reach the beach. And so I hadn't ever gone more than maybe, like, 20 miles or something. Um, and it was in Happy Valley. I think total maybe 50 miles. I don't remember how far it was. But uh, it was definitely a good workout. And you ride way out into this rural area, which was really cool, like, kind of out into the forest. Um, I think it was on somebody's private property, actually, um, but it just felt like you were out in the middle of nowhere, and that was that was a really fun festival. But it does feel freeing, and it feels um, really relaxing. Sometimes I kind of lose myself in it because I'm so used to it, and it has become so secondhand that I um, really will like drift off, <laughs> not to sleep, but to. Um, other thoughts, which is really kind of nice. I start to think about other things going on in my life as I'm writing. Should I be talking? <laughs> <laughs> She's gotta be brave and she's gotta be larger than life. I need a hero. 